Have you ever been thrown into a season or a place that you didn't want to be in? You didn't ask for it, you don't understand it, but here you are nonetheless. Well, today we're talking about how to navigate the in-between and how to make it something that doesn't take you down, but instead leads to some pretty incredible transformation. I'm so glad that you're hanging out with us today if we haven't had the chance to meet just yet. My name is Emily and I'm the pastor of Epic Online and welcome to Epic Everywhere, practical teaching to help you grow in your faith no matter where you are on your spiritual journey. The weather here in Philly has been stellar. I think we kind of leapfrogged right over spring and fast tracked our way to summer, but either way, I'm totally here for it. And speaking of summer, we have a super special event going down for the youth and our city and that's youth camp. It's going down on June 19th through the 23rd at a place called Refreshing Mountain. And it's gonna be just that. It's gonna be an awesome week filled with games, pool parties, connection, and life-changing services. I had the opportunity to go to a youth getaway a long time ago when I was a kid, and it had such a huge impact on my faith. And that's what we're believing this experience will do for so many. So if you've got youth in your family, if you've got friends, with youth their neighbors invite them to be a part you can register for that on the hub or by heading to epic.church youth and to access the hub let's go ahead and text in together you can text the word here to the number on the screen or you can go ahead and scan the qr code at the top of the hub today you'll see a place where you can let us know how we can be praying for you and you'll also see some information on giving I wanna invite you to give and to support all that God is doing in and through our church. You can click that button in the hub or head to epic.church slash give. And listen, I want you to know that when you give, your giving is making an investment into our kids and our youth. It's helping them to learn about Jesus really in a way that they can understand and apply. So thank you so much. You'll also see a spot on the hub where you can RSVP for our team celebration going down on April 27th. So if you serve on a team, this event, it's just for you, a time to celebrate all that God's been doing and celebrate all of you who are a part of making it happen. Well, for the last year, we've been on a spiritual growth journey called All In, learning how we can be totally devoted to God's plan for our lives and how we can reach our full potential individually and as a church. And to hear an update on our journey, check out this video from our lead pastor, Ken. Hey everybody, so a few weeks ago, we reached the midpoint of a two-year growth journey called All In. And so now we've got about 12 months left, one year left in this journey. We have two goals. The first is 100% engagement. We want 100% of people at Epic to commit to go all in with their faith and go on this journey with us. See, the moment that you become a follower of Jesus, God starts doing a good work in you. And if you let him, he'll start changing you from the inside out. We want 100% of people at Epic to be like, yes, I want that. I want to grow. I want God to finish what he started in my life. Now, our second goal is all about advancing the mission of our church. We want to come together and give $5.8 million over these two years so that we can fully fund our ministry plan and impact more people. Now, we just wrapped up a series talking about all of this. And the reason why was that we wanted to encourage everyone who had already made a commitment to go all in to finish strong over these next 12 months. And we wanted to give new people at Epic the opportunity to join in. Well, at the end of the series, we gave people the chance to make those commitments. And today, I've got an exciting update to share with you. So, uh, in all, 371 people submitted a card and let us know that they're committing to go all in. That's people committing to allow God access to every area of their lives so that God can go to work in them and help them grow and reach their full potential. Also, over 100 people increased their giving commitment or joined in by making a giving commitment to All In for the first time. Altogether, that represents $234,600.80 to be exact in new giving. That combined with the over 300 people who had already made a commitment to All In brings our committed All In giving total to $5.8 million which, by the way, meets our original two-year goal of $5.8 million. That's incredible. Listen, we're gonna be able to do a lot because 
of your generosity over this next year and, and this past year. But listen, that's just a number on a screen, 5.8. What's even more important is what that number represents. Listen, that number represents God at work in the lives of so many of us, being willing to say, God, we want you to have access to every part of our lives. We wanna grow into the people you're calling us to be. That number represents what happens when a group of people decide that they wanna care about the things that God cares about, that they want their heart to beat fast for the things that God's heart beats fast for, people. That number shows that many of us are willing to do all that we can to advance the mission so that more and more people can have their lives changed by Jesus. Now, I just want you to know that I'm so proud of you as a church for stepping up and allowing God to use you to make a difference. Way to go, seriously, way to go. Now, we're not done yet. We're gonna have to work hard over these next 12 months to make sure that we do finish strong and we'll make sure we give you some updates along the way. But listen, now, we still want 100% engagement. And that number 5.8, it's just a figure, right? I'd love to exceed that so we can do even more over the next year. And so if for whatever reason you weren't able to make a commitment or, or, or you didn't make a commitment, but you want to now, you still can. Just go to epic.church slash all in, uh, or you can reach out to your location pastor. They'd be more than glad to help. Listen, I'm so excited about the future and I can't wait to see all that God will do as we continue to stack hands together around this dream of ours to build a church that would impact a city now and for generations to come. Here we go, it's gonna be good. Thanks so much for that update, Kent. So much to celebrate and so much answered prayer. Thank you to each and every one of you who are already a part of this all in journey. I can't help but marvel at all that God's gonna be able to do through our collective commitment. And if you're new around here and you wanna learn more about this mission we're on and how you can join us, you can go ahead and head to our website, epic.church slash all in. Well, today we're continuing our series called Treat Yourself and we're talking talking about what to do in those seasons of in-between that we sometimes find ourselves in. And spoiler alert, Kent's got a special guest with him, so let's get to it. My name is Kent. I'm lead pastor here at Epic, and I'm so glad that you're doing church with us today. Uh, we're continuing with our series called Treat Yourself, and what we've been learning is that how you treat yourself really matters. In fact, how you treat you is one of the most important things that you do. Now, as we were preparing for this series and trying to land on what we would cover in the different weeks of this series, um, I really wanted to take one week in particular and talk about what to do when you find yourself at a place or in a space that you didn't want to be in. Like, um, you didn't ask for it, you, you can't quite make sense of it, can't understand it, but here you are nonetheless. Uh, it's like you wake up one day and all of a sudden life takes an unexpected turn. Like suddenly you're single, or suddenly you're unemployed, or um, you wake up and you, you get the phone call and you hear those words, uh, there's been an accident. Um, or maybe you get a diagnosis and people are throwing around language like tumor or malignant, and now they're talking about chemo, and you're just like trying to make sense of life in that moment. Uh, suddenly, you can find yourself in a place where you feel like you're in a bit of a desert. Well, I believe that those desert places, uh, those times when it just kind of feels uncertain, can actually be the times in our life where God does his greatest work inside of us. It could lead to the most transformational growth. Uh, but it could also be the place that our faith goes to die. And we don't want that to happen. Um, listen, how you react and respond to those seasons in your life, how you treat yourself in those seasons in your life, really do determine the person that you become on the other side of those seasons. Um, and what I've seen is that oftentimes, like I said, I think the most painful things that we go through in life can lead to some of the most beautiful things that we end up enjoying in our life. Um, whenever I think about uh, this this idea or this topic, uh, one of the people that comes to mind is actually a really good friend of mine. Uh, his name is Say, and I had the privilege, um, and I call it a privilege now, it, felt, it didn't feel like a privilege in the, in the moment, but I had the privilege of walking with him and watching him walk through a season just like this for uh, about a two year long period of time. And so I just wanted Say to come and share some of his story. And, and here's the reason why. Uh, it's because I don't know about you, but for me, um, there's something about hearing someone else's story that almost always encourages my own. 
And so as he shares some of, some of his story, man, be listening for the nuggets and the takeaways that you need to pull away for yourself as you listen, as you listen through this. And so uh, uh, here we go. Say, thanks so much for joining us today. Super excited to have this conversation. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me, Ken. Yeah, glad you're here, buddy. All right, so uh, people don't know this, but you and I, we go way back. Like way, way, way back, like almost 20 years now. Um, in fact, this is a picture from Say's high school graduation. I was there. Check this out. I, I'm going to be honest. I hate this photo. And the reason why I hate this photo is because uh, you were much bigger, but uh, I was littler. And I wish we could just swap again and go back, go back to that. But yeah, uh, we were talking about this in 2005 is when you graduated high school. And uh, so we've known each other for even before that for, for quite a long time. Yeah. 20 plus years. 20 plus years. Yeah. 20 plus years. So anyways, uh, to get us started, I think it'd be fun for you to share just a little bit of your background and um, uh, where you're from. Where'd you come from? Sure. So born and raised in Chicago. I moved to the Philadelphia area uh, around high school. Um, first generation. And yeah, I was, I was raised as Buddhist before I, I came to faith. Really? So, all right. So you raised as a Buddhist. How did you end up becoming a follower of Jesus? What's that story? Oh, man. So, so during my junior year of high school, I was invited to youth group. Uh, by a couple of cute girls, and <laughs> and then I showed up. That always does it. Those <laughs> cute girls, they'll get you there, that's for sure. So uh, I know this part of the story because I was there. I was the youth pastor of that youth group. I remember the moment when you walked in. Uh, you were the largest Asian fella I've ever met. Uh, I was like, wow, look at him. And I was thinking, I, I, I remember thinking, like, why is he here? And then I saw who you came with, and I was like, ah, oh, that's why. That is why you came. So you were with the, with the cute girls, which totally made sense. Uh, pretty quickly after that, though, I learned that oh, though you were very big and intimidating as a high schooler, uh, you've got the biggest heart and one of the kindest people that I've ever met. And so try to keep that secret. Yeah, I'll keep it. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. So uh, you mentioned that you were raised, uh, you were raised a Buddhist. You came to faith as a, uh, became a follower of Jesus. Um, so after that, like, what was your story like? Was it like all up and to the right? After that, as far as your faith and your journey and everything else like that? Man, I wish, right? Um, no, I, I would say I was on fire for the Lord for the first year or so. Um, going to college, even post-college, I definitely had my roller coasters of uh, bad decisions. Yeah, so you needed a better youth pastor is what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. I tried. I gave him my best. So, um, yeah, so, you know, just like a lot of people, you, you uh, went to college and, and your faith took... Uh, took a turn, kind of did your own thing for a little while, which is common for a lot of people's story. But eventually you found your way back to faith. Um, what what kind of led to led to that? Yeah, so I was, you know, in a point in my life, this was, you know, post-college. I was uh, doing my own thing for a while, and I just felt so empty, right? So I got to a point where I was like, hey, God, you know, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. You know, so I started to say yes. That's awesome. And uh, one of the yeses that you said was, and kind of marking this period of time in your life, was you made a decision to get baptized. And uh, I had the privilege of being there for that as well. In fact, we got a photo. You can check this out. So, um, and maybe, maybe actually a couple photos that you can, you can look at from that. And that was a really special day. And it was really special for me to be able to be part of that moment in your life as well. And so uh, you kind of get your faith back on track. You're moving through life. Uh, what happened after that? Yeah, so, you know, through just saying yes to God, it led me to co-leading a missions life group where I met my wife at the time. Um, shortly after that, we got married. And then shortly after that, we had a uh, baby boy named Troy, which completely changed my life. That's awesome. And so you were, you're married. And then at some point, life took a turn. R- real quick, tell us, uh, tell us about your marriage. Like, what was, that, what was that like? Yeah, so, I mean, just like any other marriage, right? It had its up, ups and downs. Um, but I think from the outside looking in, it was the perfect marriage. We had the house, we had the white pig fence, the cars, you know, everything that you could ever want for in life. Had all the stuff. Had all the stuff. Run into Disney. Disney World a couple of times, you know. Yeah. But then things, like I said, they, they took a turn. They did. So I would say uh, in 2019, that's when my world just fell apart, right? My, uh, my wife at the time had come home from a business trip and pretty much told me that she didn't want to be married to me anymore. So in one sentence, you go from feeling like things are okay, uh, certainly has challenges, but then in one sentence, your whole world is turned upside down. Um, and she says she didn't want to be married anymore. So that's a lot to unpack. 
uh, in like in that moment, what were what were you feeling, and um, how did you choose to try and navigate some of that like right away in in the moment? Yeah, that's a great question. So, for me, especially in that that point, you know, we were believers, we were leaders in our church, and I was just like this. It, it almost didn't feel real. It was like a dream. Um, you know, this type of stuff doesn't happen to people like us, right? So for me, it was just getting past that point of this isn't real, right? This isn't happening to me to then just letting all those emotions kind of hit me that this is happening, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, I remember you shot me a call. And uh, if it wasn't that day, it was the next day. We were sitting in my driveway and uh, just trying to process everything that was happening, prayed together and um, tried to figure out a path forward. And I remember your resolve or desire to fight for your marriage. And, um, uh, and you know, like from out the gate, you were like, all right, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fight for this. Uh, what kinds of things did you do to try and fight for your marriage like at the beginning there? Yeah, so, you know, for me, divorce was an option, right? I had made a, a covenant to God and made a commitment. So I was going to do everything and anything I could on my end. So, you know, first thing was just holding myself accountable, right? I, I got into to marriage counseling right away. It was just me at first. Um, with, you by it was just me um, with the hopes that, you know, she would attend the counseling sessions with me. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was that. It was verbally communicating that, hey, I'm not going anywhere. And, you know, I stayed in the home for pretty much the whole divorce process. So how, how long was that journey where um, you were fighting for things? I would say from, from start to finish, it was probably a year, a little over a year. So for a whole year, you're saying, I'm here, you stayed, you guys lived in the home together, um, and you were committed to uh, loving and serving um, your family during that, and not just saying, hey, I'm, I'm out. Most people would just cut bait and run. Um, what was the reason you didn't do that? Yeah, so, you know, for me, there was, you know, from my standpoint, there was a biblical means to, to divorce, there was a moral um, right on my end to divorce, right, through some unfaithfulness. Um, but my North Star was always, you know, what's God calling me to do? You know, I made a covenant to him, like I said, I made a commitment. And through wise counsel in my life and trying to figure out how I want to write my story, you know, I, I made a commitment. So for me, that was always what I was striving for. So I remember that for that whole year, you refused to take off your ring. Yeah, so for me, you know, the ring is the, the symbol, right? The symbol of the commitment that I made and, and the covenant. So I, I made a vow to God that I wasn't going to take it off. You know, I, I would take it off for training and stuff like that, but fully taken off, like that wasn't on the table. Now, how, how did God um, provide for you and care for you in that season that you were walking through? Oh, man. So that's a lot, right? He just, I felt like he just, protect me in this bubble because when I say that it felt like a movie or like the whole kitchen sink was thrown at me that's what it felt like you know at sometimes it didn't it didn't feel real almost but throughout all that you know I I just felt protected so you're 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 um s surrounding yourself with people who are, are trying to encourage you and and support you through that you're um you know staying uh, true to your faith and connected to God, you know, through all of this. Um, and so you go through a whole year of this. And then at the end, like it all worked out and everybody's happy, lives happily ever after. Right. That's what happened next. So that was the hope, right? That was the hope as, as that whole season started for me. But I, I can't say that that wasn't the case. Um, it ended in divorce um, a year after that. So officially, I think the um, divorce day was November 2020. So about a year had passed. Um, and, and yeah, there was no reconciliation of the family. It just, we went our separate ways. Yeah. Well, so what were some of the emotions and feelings that you had like on the heels of that? Like when, in the moment when that happened? Yeah. So I think it was two parts. So on one hand, I had felt like a failure. I felt like I had failed my family. I felt like I had failed my son. Um, I just, I just felt such a, a bad, um, feeling towards that. But on the other hand, it was so freeing. You know, I felt like I had lived up to my commitment to God. I felt like I did everything I could do. And for me, it was being able to tell that story, right? So 
knowing that I could look at my son and, and tell him I did everything I could, it, it just meant everything to me. Yeah, that was one of the things in our conversations through that whole period that uh, I really respected about how you approach things is uh, you made choice after choice, decision after decision, not based out of your feelings in the moment uh, or being upset or angry. You made decisions out of what story do I want to be able to tell one day about this? What story am I going to say to my son, Troy? What story do I want to, with integrity, be able to say about how I handled this whole situation? And I just watched you kind of stay the path that whole time um, and was really just like impressed that you, um, that you kept that as a priority. And what a North Star. What story do I want to be able to tell one day? So uh, you did that really well. Um, so you, you, you're at this place where you're like, okay, I'm divorced. And now what? So at that, at that point when you hit the kind of now what, what did you turn your attention and your effort to? I mean, all your energy has gone toward trying to preserve this marriage, and then it didn't. So now what do you do? Yeah, so, you know, as I think back to that period, it was, man, I'm divorced. Everybody around me is married, you know. I felt a sense of loneliness, right? I felt like the third, the fourth wheel when I would go out with friends, etc. But I really, in just developing my faith with God, especially coming from that season, I really wanted to focus on some key priorities in my life, right? And that was my faith, uh, my commitment to my son, and then just myself. Right. So I just I chose to really hone in on those things. How did you focus on your commitment to your son? So I just tried to be the best dad I can be. Right. Whether it was taking him to what, whatever random event that was happening in, in Bucks County at that time or, you know, just choosing to be intentional about the time we had together. Yeah. And then how did you focus on your faith? So, you know, kind of just what I've done throughout my um, my faith journey is just saying yes, you know, whether, whether it was saying yes to serving at church, saying yes to helping somebody move, you know, any, anything that would inconvenience me at that point, it was just saying yes to that. Yeah. And you would, you would send me, um, this guy would send me uh, a text message from the Poconos. He had a friend who had a house in the Poconos, and he would go up there on the weekends um, with just yourself or just you and Troy, and he'd send me a message in the morning with his coffee, and he's like, I'm just sitting here on the dock, I'm just praying and uh, spending time with God, and... Um, you know, you read scripture and you send me a little, little note and I'd be like, look at this guy, just like, you know, moving forward. Um, you also put a lot of energy towards school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what, what, what ended up happening with that? Yeah. So, you know, in efforts of bettering myself and just, you know, making sure I was progressing, I decided to go back and, and get my MBA. Yeah. You got your MBA. I did. Graduated, which is pretty, pretty awesome that you did that. So uh, single dad. Um, on the other side of a divorce, working full time job, and got your MBA, you were just going after it, man. You you uh, didn't rest on your laurels at all, uh, which is really impressive. So, um, also I, I imagine that this time was very difficult and very lonely. Um, I'm sure there's some low moments. In those moments, I think that it's easy to complain. It's easy to think that um, God must not be good. So did you have some of those feelings? How did you keep from falling into that? So, Yeah, you know, and I think just like everybody else, you, you get through something terrible like that, right? And then you're just like, all right, God, I've come out of this. Give me what's mine. You know, so for me, it's, you know, whatever relationship or whatever was supposed to be at the end of it. And so at that point, you know, I'm not going to lie. I was angry at God. I was like, this is not how it's supposed to end. You know, what's next for me, et cetera. Um, but throughout all that, I, I learned that, hey, like, I just, I just, I just need to trust God. He, has, he brought me through the season, right? And he's going to be faithful, and he has been faithful. Yeah. What, um, what kept your faith from dying during that time? Man, so I, I talk about this um, a lot as I'm sharing my story. You know, for, for some folks, they kind of look at that grand miracle, right? Something that's at the end of the, the road where it's just, God just blesses you tremendously. And for me, as I reflect, you know, God sprinkled those miracles throughout my whole season. You know, he just, he just kept me going. And that's kind of what kept me going in my faith and trusting him. And maybe some examples of what those miracles were. Yeah. So he, you know, he, you know, you mentioned relationships. He brought a lot of relationships in my life from my past. Um, he brought new relationships in. Um, there were certain things that were happening at work at the time that he just kept, you know, he just kept being faithful to me. 
yeah, I think in a season like that, you learn to pray, God, uh, give me this day my our, our daily bread. Like, just give me what I need to be able to make it through today. And I think that's the miracle. It's not the, uh, you know, the big miracle at the end that, you know, happens all at once. It's the, the miracle of just being able to make it one more day as you trust him to provide for you along the way. Um, so I, I got to watch you do that too. So, okay. Um, you're divorced. You are on the market <laughs> for say. So did you like run right out and start dating or like, how did you approach that? Yeah. So, you know, being that I had a son that I really, I just wanted to make sure he was protected. Whoever was going to come into my life, they they need to be it, right? And so I just trusted God. I was like, hey, obviously I didn't do this right the first time. I'm just going to completely trust you. And if you have some money for me, then cool, I'm all in, right? So I, I didn't, I wasn't quick to jump on like a dating app or I wasn't quick to, swiping. I was not swiping. Not swiping. I was not quick to, to go out to some local hangout or bar to, to meet somebody. Like I, I wasn't for that. Um, I was just trusting God. Yeah. And then, uh, but then you did end up meeting somebody special. So how'd that happen? Yeah. So, you know, it was at a point where I was like, Hey God, I'm ready. You know, whoever you have for me, I'm going to trust. So just, just let me know. Like right. tag. And that was like, uh, that was like a year. Yeah. It was, it was almost a year until after the divorce was like officially. Yeah. Over. Okay. And, uh, yeah. So I signed up for this, uh, life group, which was a hiking life group through Epic church. And, you know, there was many reasons for me missing the first meeting that they had. I showed up about 30, 40 minutes late and people were gracious. But as I walked up to the group, um, there was one person that I noticed in particular right away. Oh, yeah. What was her name? So her name was Cassie. Right. <laughs> At the time, I didn't think anything of it. I was like, cool, cute girl. Um, hopefully I'll get to to get to know her, have conversations with her. But that I just left it at that. Yeah. And you found out you guys had a lot in common. Yeah, so I was there was another guy in a group that we were just walking and talking. He was kind of asking me, you know, how, what I did for exercise or working out, et cetera. And I had mentioned that, you know, I trained in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I used to be a fighter, et cetera. And then out of nowhere, I hear this voice, you know, from my back. Oh, hey, you do Jiu-Jitsu? I do Jiu-Jitsu as well. Okay, so you hooked up with somebody that could take you out if she wanted to. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and eventually you guys end up getting engaged. Yeah. yeah. And... Yeah, so so God definitely redeemed my story, right? Like we we took a year, um, we just got to know each other. Um, we were trying to do things the right way. Um, we're saving a lot of things for for marriage, and yeah, it was about a year. And I proposed to her um, December of twenty twenty two, Christmas Day. And then you got married. Then we got married. So we got married July twenty ninth of twenty twenty three. In fact, we have a photo from your wedding day. Just pretty awesome. I got to see it in person. Um, it was a beautiful, beautiful day, beautiful wedding, and uh, couldn't couldn't imagine a, a more beautiful couple. Really, uh, the two of you, and especially be able to celebrate to celebrate that with you. Now, um, so okay. Now, this is a nice little pretty bow on what is a very difficult <laughs> and challenging story for sure, um, and difficult times. Like looking back now, the mm -hmm. on your story mm -hmm. uh, or that portion of your story. Um, what are like the key takeaways that you, you take from your story, maybe going forward? Sure. You know, I would say as I ha has had a, a chance to reflect and just go back, right? The one thing I would tell to someone kind of going through this is like, never lose hope, you know, like just have that faith in God that he's going to carry you through. You know, it's tough to see that while you're in the season. But as I look back and just see everything that God has done and everything that God continues to do, it's never lose that hope. Yeah. I mean, we know that God is faithful. Um, it doesn't feel like it in the moment, but he is. And ultimately, you're able to look back and see that he's been faithful um, as you've maintained hope through a difficult and challenging season. Um, I think another thing that um, is easy to take away, just me watching from the outside in, is um, you know, God doesn't waste our pain. And he doesn't even waste a waiting season because it was, it was two years of Difficult decision after difficult decision for you um, that I watched you make. And I see how God has then used that difficult time to put you in a position to be able to connect with and talk with and encourage so many other people. You tell me all the time, you're like, oh, I'm just, I'm over the Poconos with so-and-so and I got this person with me and we went and hung out and grabbed lunch. And so like, how, how has that part of the journey been for you as God has used part of your story to be an encouragement to other people? 
Yeah, that's you know that's been the awesome part about seeing what God's done in my life, right? And and throughout that season, I was like, hey God, I don't know what's gonna happen, but I'm open to whatever you want to do with me, however you want me to to use this, right? And He's called me to speak into so many marriages, right? He's brought so many people along the way who are going through similar things, who have gone through, you know, similar things, and I've been able to really speak into their lives, and not just from like a you know, theoretical point of view, but I actually lived it. Yeah, who better to come along some side someone who's walking through a dark, difficult, desert like experience than someone who's been through that same dark, difficult, desert like yeah. experience. Um and I love and hearing how you kind of navigate all that is that you aren't always just um telling people what they want to hear. Like you're willing to say the hard things. Like, hey, you made a commitment. You need to stick to your commitment. And um um, not just give people an out, but say, Hey, you need to, you need to fight for this thing that, um, that God has given you. And so I've, I love that's been part of your story as well. I think it's pretty awesome. And so, uh, thanks for, thanks for sharing all that. There's so much, I think that we could take away from your story. I'm sure that, I mean, stuff that I didn't even point out in the story, I'm sure, uh, many of you have t- taken away as well. Uh, as I was thinking about this, I was thinking about how it parallels in some ways the story of Moses and uh, the children of Israel whenever they found themselves in a desert season, um, going through a desert experience. And, and, and it, I think what, what you can learn from their desert experience and in some ways from your desert experience um, are a few things in particular, because you would think that in a, in a desert um, that not much good can come from it, that not... Uh, not much growth could come from it, but it turns out that deserts are incredibly fertile ground for some things in particular. Um, I want to share four with you real quick, uh, just for some takeaways for today. So the first one is this, uh, the desert is fertile ground for complaint. Isn't that true? Like when you find yourself in that season, it's easy to complain and get upset. In fact, the children of um, of Israel, it said that they murmured and complained. And really what they're saying is, I'm sick of this. I'm sick of the situation that I'm in. I'm, I'm sick of having to do the things that I have to do in this season. I didn't ask for this, but, but here I am in the middle of this challenging time. Um, and, you know, for us, it might be something like I'm sick of uh, having to live in my parents' basement and keep getting outbid on houses over and over and over again. Um, I'm sick of feeling financially strapped. I'm sick of this health situation that I find myself in that I didn't ask for. Sick of being unemployed, whatever it is. Sick of being single is one. Um, you, we can find ourselves in this place where we're just, we're just sick and we can complain. And I think the thing to take away is that um, you need to know that in those seasons, your heart is in danger of being overwhelmed and overcome and, and taken to a place where it moves you away from God instead of moving toward God. And so like a desert, it is a fertile ground for complaint and that type of stuff. But also this, the desert is also fertile ground for a meltdown, right? And that's true. Like um, in, in Moses' story, we see this moment where he just kind of lets loose on God and um, is just saying, hey, like this burden is too heavy for me to, to carry. It's, it's too heavy of a burden for me to, uh, to be able to continue carrying going forward. And um, in fact, he goes on to say, he basically says, if you love me, just kill me now. Like, I don't know how bad things have ever gotten for you, but you get to that place where you're like, God, just kill me now. You know, it's, it's not a good situation. Um, if you stay in any desert, for long enough, um, it'll break you. It just will. Um, and, and I love that you, when you look at the pages of Scripture, Scripture doesn't hide suffering. Like we see suffering over and over and over again. And part of that is encouraging to me, one, because it lets me know that whenever I'm suffering, I'm not alone. Like there's other people who've walked down this path and have been down this road before, and so I'm not alone in that way. And also it lets me know that when I read Moses' story that God can handle our rants. Like, God can handle it whenever we're like, this is too heavy. This is too hard. Like, God, I need you to, I need you to do something, you know? Um, and I think the important thing there is that we just keep the lines of communication open with God. Even if we don't have anything good to say. Even if it's just, this is hard. Um, I, I read this somewhere. Uh, it talked about the three rules of a dysfunctional family, uh, which are um, don't feel, don't talk, and don't trust. But if you look at scripture, one of the things you see, particularly with a relationship with God, is that we're constantly encouraged to feel and to speak and to trust. Because that's what is made up of a, that's what creates a healthy relationship, you know? And so uh, the desert is fertile ground for a meltdown. But it's also fertile ground for God's provision, you know? 
Uh, that's the place where God could step in and do what only he can do. Um, God provided for Moses, brought 70 leaders along with him to help carry the burden. Literally, the thing that he complained about, this is too heavy for me to carry. God brought 70 leaders along to help carry that burden. And in here, just like in your story, we see God not just doing this like big miracle that fixed everything and got them out of the desert, but God provided daily what Moses needed. Someone to come along and help carry the burden for that day. God, give me today my daily bread. And that's part of what we learn when we go through desert seasons. And the last thing is this, the desert is fertile ground for growth. So the desert can be a greenhouse for our faith and it can grow our faith, or it can be the place where our faith goes to die. But you decide, I decide, you decide what happens in that desert. Um, See, oftentimes I think that the conditions are too harsh in a desert for your faith to just kind of stay neutral. You're either going to move toward God or you're going to move away from God and you get to choose what you do in that moment. Uh, You get to choose how the person that you become on the other side of it. You ever wonder why old people are either like super kind and sweet and wonderful or like way bitter and angry and you're like, why is there no in between? Like, what is that about? How are they so? Well, you know, you go through stuff in life and it pushes you one way or another. Right, The decisions of your heart while you're walking through the desert really do determine the person that you become on the other side of that experience. Um, and so uh, it can lead to incredible growth, not just incremental growth, but incredible growth if you let it. I think the prayer that we need to pray is, you know, God, I don't like this. I didn't expect this. I didn't ask for it, but I'm going to trust you through it. I don't like it. I didn't expect it. I didn't ask for it, but I'm going to trust you through it. Um, and what's cool about that is that the desert that you despise or the land that you loathe ends up producing the fruit in your life that you and other people love. And it's one of the things I've seen with you is I walk, watched you walk through this terribly difficult season, but I see the man that you've become on the other side of it and the story that you get to tell because of the way that you navigated it. And I'm, I'm just so proud, so proud. Uh, in fact, uh, you uh, say have... You've amazed me at every chapter of your journey. Like going back to high school. In high school, uh, Say decided to take me to the gym one day. Because he's like, man, you need help. And so we go to the gym, and uh, he's like, he lets me go first. And then he gets on the same machine and just adds 100 pounds. 100 pounds! <laughs> just goes, boom, 100 more, and just does it like it's nothing. And I, was, I just stood there amazed, amazed at this, at this high schooler who was showing me up. And then when you were training for uh, all the MMA fighting that you were doing, um, I went to your very first fight and you walked in there and you're just so kind and cuddly. But then when they went ding, ding, it was on, it was on <laughs> a, and say, just choked the guy, this huge guy, just choked him out. Like it was another day at the office <laughs> and, and walking and I just stood there amazed. I was like, look, look at this guy. Um, and then, um, uh, when, when you were going on the other side of your divorce, um, and you were a single dad and you went to get your MBA you're trying to navigate life working full time. Uh, you graduated uh, with your degree. I got to be there for that as well. Here's a picture. Um, I was amazed you. that you were, you were able to do that. And more than anything, though, as I look back at just the different chapters of Say, um, I, I was most amazed by your unwavering faith in Jesus when you were going through the hardest and most difficult season in your life. Um, every turn, I watched you choose integrity over what you were feeling in the moment. I watched you choose character over and over and over again. Um, And I watched you stand in faith and and trust God through um, a time that most people would have just tapped and and walked away. And you didn't do that. So I was definitely amazed by that. And so I figured no better way to end all of this than to ask you to join me in praying for for anybody else who maybe finds themselves in um, a desert season, a difficult place. And I hope that you walk away from Say's story encouraged that God will meet you right there where you are, that he'll be with you through it, and that there's good things on the other side of it, and that he's working in you to help help you become the person he wants you to be, even through that difficult time. So let's pray together. God, we love you, and we thank you so much that you first loved us. And Lord, I pray that you'd give us the wisdom to know what to do with what we heard today, and then the courage to do it. For those who find themselves um, in the middle of a desert type of season right now, God, I just pray that um, 
that you'd meet them right there where they are, that you'd provide um, this day their daily bread, what they need to make it through one more day, and that one day they'll be able to look back and see how, how faithful you were to provide all the way, all the way through. Um, God, I pray you'd give us wisdom as a church to know how we can come alongside and support, and we just thank you that you've got a grander plan that we're all part of, um, that you never leave us or forsake us, that you're with us, and I pray that uh, trust that you would continue to do that in all of our lives. We love you. Thank you that you love us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, everybody. I hope you were challenged and encouraged. Say thanks for hanging out with me today. Thanks for having me. Uh, we'll see you guys next week for the next episode of Treat Yourself. See you then. Thank you so much for that message, Kent, and say I am so grateful for your vulnerability and transparency and really for the way that you have followed Jesus through the most difficult of deserts. That concept that the decisions that you make in the desert will determine who you will become on the other side of it is so powerful. I think it really gives us this sense of urgency not to really waste the season that God has for us, whether we want to be in it or not, whether it makes any sense to us or not, and not to get caught up in the trap of trying to speed our way through it or numb our way through it, but that if we lean into God and we grow in Him, it'll lead to not just incremental growth, but it'll lead to transformational growth. So I hope you were challenged and encouraged today. And listen, before you go, would you help us reach even more and more people? Take time to go ahead and like, comment, subscribe to this channel, and also take time to share this with someone who might be encouraged. And invite someone to join you next week. We're talking all about mental health. It's going to be good. So I'll see all of you right back here next week. Oh, 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 oh,